and reading in the Hebrew Bible. 201, which is this class, is a prerequisite for 202, which is the second half of beginning Hebrew. Uh, the student is also instructed in the use of computer-assisted research programs and receives credit for 208. I'm not sure what 208 is, but um, uh, the computer thing will probably come more in the next term than this term. Uh, this is really a description for both the first and second term. During 202, the students read the Book of Ruth, a uh, required course for MDiv and MTF. Uh, course objectives. Upon successful completion of this course, the student will be able to uh, recognize and reproduce the Hebrew forms and endings presented in the textbook, uh, demonstrate a mastery of the Hebrew English vocabulary as offered in the textbook, demonstrate a working familiarity with BDB. Who knows what BDB is? Brown Driver Bridge. That's your lexicon. So this term, uh, you'll pick up this uh, very foundational uh, lexicon. Uh, you know, that's, that's just the uh, classic you know, that everybody has used. It's, uh, maybe not know, but probably Moses. And um, so you'll pick that up. You have to pick that up, hopefully, this term. Next term, we'll give you a shorter one that's uh, easier, maybe better for just reading and translation. Uh, so you'll have uh, both of those. So we'll get a working uh, familiarity with BDB this term. Uh, demonstrate an introductory familiarity with the BHS. What's the BHS? That's the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, which is here. And which is the Old Testament half of your Biblia Sacra. So you can do it all together as you have, which is kind of nifty. Uh, or you can get them obviously in the So uh, obviously we're concentrating on the Hebrew Bible part of that Greek and Hebrew Bible that you have purchased. So that's a nifty volume, isn't it? They didn't have that when I was in seminary. All right, and then the student will be able to demonstrate an ability to translate on an el elementary level certain portions of the Hebrew Bible. Instruction will be by lecture and interaction, and questions and answers are encouraged. And since that's the case, do we have any questions or comments so far? In course objective. You know, just uh, like the Greek class, basically, uh, fewer forms, a lot fewer forms to, uh, to memorize. Um, but maybe a little bit greater challenge because it's less like English in terms of the vocabulary and things like that. Um, course text, you, uh, you'll need your VHS or your uh, Biblia Sacra, uh, same thing in the Old Testament. Uh, the Grammar by Pratico and Van Pelt, uh, Basics of Biblical Hebrew, your Lexicon, Brown Bible Brief, and then the uh, vocabulary cards. I saw some of so this one. So does everybody have those vocabulary cards? Those are extremely helpful. Um, the way I suggest, well, you can do it a couple ways. Uh, if you want to do the paper boy thing, that's a good thing. Uh, you can use a hole punch and uh, you know, punch a hole in relatively the same place, approximately the same place in each card. You get one of those paper boy ring things that you can get at the office supply store. <coughs> and uh, that's a good way to kind of keep them together. Alternately, you can use a rubber band and you don't have to punch the hole. Uh, but part of the point of using the cards is um, portability. <coughs> so you can take them with you, and I'd encourage you to do that. You know, take them with you. You know, when you're someplace, if you're you know sitting in the doctor's office for an appointment or something, you have I'm going to say 10 or 15 minutes. That's probably like 45 minutes. And, you know, you can just whip those out and study them. But part of the point of having the um, the cards is so that you can uh, change the order of the cards. Because if you uh, learn the vocabulary words from the same list all the time, you're really learning them in context. And when they're given back to you, either in a quiz or in the Bible, they're not going to be in that context. So you want to try to learn them um, independent of... Thanks, Cyrus. You're awesome. You want to try to learn those uh, vocabulary words independent of any context. So... Um, you know, mix them up uh, from time to time. Also, you can make two or three different uh, piles of cards 
um, I might suggest if you get the rings, you have two or three different rings. Um, one ring would be for your newest vocabulary cards that you're studying. Uh, one ring would be for the vocabulary cards that you have down cold. You know, I know these. I'll put them on this ring. And then the other ring would be for those that are kind of somewhere in between. right? And as you feel like you just know a word, you can take it off of uh, the middle and put it on the one that you just really know. And uh, so the newest ones you might review every day. And the other one you might review three or four times a week. And then maybe once a week you review all of them. See? So there's no point in going over a whole stack of uh, vocabulary words every day if you know a half of them or two-thirds of them or something like that. Right? Now, the text that you're going to get is going to come with a CD. And uh, it will have on it, I believe, a vocabulary program. Isn't that right, Carl? Uh, it has a, uh, just uh, the word that he refers to the Hebrew word and then it speaks that Hebrew word so you can so you can understand. So you can hear it. Okay. Does it have a vocabulary drilling program? Uh, you can, uh, maybe not on the CD, but you can get it. And that's kind of cool if you want to use your computer to, to drill you. And uh, if I understand the, the that program, that program keeps track of uh, words you get right and words you get wrong. And it kind of does that sorting for you. you know. um, but in any case, those, uh, those cards are really helpful because... Now, you have a laptop, you can probably carry it around, but you might have those cards with you when you wouldn't even have the laptop. But for example, you could have your uh, vocabulary cards at the gym with you, couldn't you? You, know, and you could be walking on the treadmill and looking at your vocabulary uh, or whatever. Um, also, the text is going to come with a workbook, and uh, so we'll use both of those together. Uh, now, I'm not going to... Um, look over your shoulder uh, when it comes to doing the workbook. I mean, you know, this is graduate school, right? You're going to need to do the work in the workbook. You might not have to do it all. Or you might tell yourself, well, I'm going to do, you know, every other one or, you know, whatever you need to do. Um, but you work in the workbook uh, to the extent that you need to do that to get it down. You will need to work in the workbook some, no doubt. Uh, just to know you've got it down, right? But I'm not going to collect that. I'm not going to grade you on your workbook. What I will do is potentially quiz you from the workbook. You know, I might I might lift some things out of the workbook and put those on a quiz just to keep you honest, right? Um, but uh, that's not something I'm going to actually give you a, a grade on. So that's kind of for you and use it as it helps you. Uh, but don't short yourself because that's just exactly what you'd be doing if you if you just really short yourself on uh, time working through those exercises in the workbook. So of course opportunities. There will be vocabulary quizzes from the assigned chapters in Pratico. Uh, these quizzes may be cumulative. So uh, you know I can go back all the way to the beginning on each quiz if I want to and pick a word out. So once you've you know, gone past a week, that doesn't mean you can forget those words. You have to keep those words flowing through your review. Um, plan on having a vocabulary quiz every week. You might not have one, uh, but you could. And, you know, if, uh, if I think that you're probably real up to snuff on the vocabulary and you're working hard and doing your work, I might just send a sheet around and have everybody sign it for attendance and everybody gets full credit on the vocabulary quiz just to save time in class or whatever, right? Uh, but that's only if I think that you're really putting the effort in. I mean, we have various ways of quizzing on vocabulary. Great guys, right? And um, so we can, you know, uh, find creative ways to see if you're doing your vocabulary, but we just might have, uh, you know, a sheet for you with, boom, ten vocabulary words on or something like that that you have to write the English. I'll never give you English words that you have to write the Hebrew word for. Uh, it'll always be, here's a Hebrew word, write the English definition uh, for the word. But uh, just, you know, plan on being quizzed on the vocabulary, at least in one form or another, uh, every week. Uh, also, plan on there being a quiz on the forms or grammar from the chapter every week as well. Now, again, there may not actually be a quiz, but we may find some creative way uh, to quiz you 
Um, but uh, it's fair game for there to be a quiz on that every week as well. So uh, there will be quizzes number two covering forms and endings from the chapters covered in Pratico and material from the corresponding sections of the workbook. So if you if you are able to handle what's in the workbook and if you you know know the chapter from the grammar and I will tell you when there are forms you need to know and there are a few forms you just have to memorize you know it's just memorization um, and when those forms come up uh, I will tell you know this and you need to know it and that and it could be on a quiz um, as the term progresses we'll have translation quizzes. Uh, obviously it's kind of tough to quiz you on translating very early in the term um, my philosophy is that uh, I want to get you in your Hebrew Bible as soon as possible I want to get you uh, translating as soon as possible um, tonight my intention on this very night very first night you've ever been in Hebrew get you in your Hebrew Bible uh, open up your Hebrew Bible and, and get you working in your Hebrew Bible uh, after all, that's why we're taking Hebrew, right? That's where our motivation lies. And uh, so this is going to be a lot of work, and, and I want to keep you motivated. So we're going to we're going to get in our Bible right away. And as 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 we're able to do that, uh, I will assign you um, a verse or verses or something, you know, to go away uh, and be able to translate. So uh, uh, part of a quiz might be. Um, Translate eventually translate you know this verse and parse this verb and so you can write out translate it parse it parsing guys in Hebrew too is that awesome um, so that we're not going to quiz on translation obviously for a while and uh, we'll see how soon and then there'll be a final exam uh, covering all of those things and it'll be a take home exam and uh, uh, so I'll give it to you. This is a Greek exam. I just got back. Isn't that exciting? Uh, so I'll give it to you, and uh, you'll take it away. Do it and mail it back to me, or however you get it back to me. All right. Any questions on that so far? By the way, I better put it in here before I leave. <laughs> no, no. The one thing I forgot to say on the instructions for these uh, Greek exams is that you should make a copy of it before you mail it. That's always a smart thing to do, isn't it? Okay, any questions on this so far? Sound all right? This is the real stuff here. You know? So your vocabulary quizzes will be 20% of your grade. Your grammar quizzes will be 20% of your grade. Your translation quizzes will be 20% of your grade. And your final will be 40% of your grade. All students are expected to attend all class sessions. No late work will be accepted, except in the case of extenuating circumstances. How do we define extenuating circumstances? Yeah, but yeah, if it involves insurance, then it's probably an extenuating circumstance. So you know, house insurance, like your house floods or something, you know, uh, car insurance. Well, you know, life insurance it doesn't have to be you though, right? I mean, you know, if you uh, someone, well, never mind. If uh, you have to use health insurance, you know, if you were sick and had to go to the doctor. Now, say I don't have insurance, but if you would have used insurance, you know, that's okay. anyway. You get the idea. Uh, if it's a serious thing, then we'll talk about late work. Otherwise, we'll need it in on time. All right. The use of any tool to complete coursework other than those introduced by the professor is strongly discouraged. You can probably um, find things out there like interlinears and stuff that might be kind of tempting. Um, don't even get close to those at this point because it's not going to help you really. Uh, the time will come when other tools may be a benefit for the student and some of them will be introduced by me at the proper time. In the beginning, however, these tools will almost certainly prove to be a hindrance to the student learning the language. Uh, tools are a crutch. Right? Uh, every, every tool is a crutch. So anything that you use uh, besides just your Hebrew Bible is a crutch. Your lexicon is a crutch, right? 
your grammar is a crutch. Um, however, uh, you know, we are all uh, in need of crutches, aren't we? Uh, the thing that you need to ask yourself is, uh, is the crutch I'm using helping me get better or keeping me from getting better? See? Uh, a lexicon is the kind of crutch that helps you get better. Because hopefully, if you spend the time looking up a word in a lexicon, you're going to learn it and uh, you know, know more about that. <coughs> a grammar is a crutch that helps you get better. Uh, because as we go through the grammar, obviously, you're going to be learning something. But when you refer back to the grammar at a later time, um, you know, that's going to help you. Because if you take the time to look something up in the grammar, you have a greater chance of uh, remembering it and uh, assimilating it. Right? Um, an interlinear is a crutch that will not help you get better. It will keep you sick. So don't even touch an interlinear. Um, because your eye will automatically, you won't be able to keep your eye from going straight to the English because that's what you know. So you'll be looking at the English words and it just, it just won't. No good. Now, you know, you can use a computer, a computer program that can be helpful, but right now, um, if you learn to rely upon that, it's probably not going to be a good thing for you. <coughs> so what we're looking for now is those vocabulary cards. That's a good crutch, right? Uh, that's just going to help you get stronger. The lexicon, that's a good crutch. The grammar, that's a good crutch. So um, use those things and um, then you will grow in your ability to do Hebrew. Use some of the other things uh, and it will hinder you in your ability to do Hebrew. Now, uh, who, has, who has not learned a foreign language before? Anybody? Okay. Uh, I know the first foreign language that I learned in my life was uh, Greek in college, <laughs> which was which was a little bit unfortunate. Um, I don't know, maybe it says something about my educational experience before then. But in any case, um, if you've learned a foreign language before, you you will have learned some tricks, I'm sure, for learning language. You know what it's like. Um, but just like I told the guys in Greek, um, it's really really important that you. Um, forget the stuff that we learn because um, you'll not really have it permanently until you've forgotten it several times. So uh, when you see new forms, whatever, try to forget it as quickly as you can and then relearn it as quickly as you can. And, you know, just try really hard to forget the stuff, right? Uh, forget it a lot. And relearn it right away. And uh, then, I don't know how many times it will be, but, uh, you know, when you've relearned it enough, then you'll have it forever, or at least for a week or two, right? Uh, so when you forget what you've learned, uh, you should be very encouraged because you're just that much further along in the process. Um, learning Greek or Hebrew uh, is all about review. This is, this is about nothing but review. Uh, relearning over and over and over. If you've ever, if you've ever written anything of substance, uh, you know, anything substantial that had to be of a high quality, uh, you know that uh, writing is really a process of rewriting, isn't it? I mean, nobody ever sits down and whips something out in their first draft and it's good to go. I mean, you do that with letters and you know, articles for the church newsletter and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, if you're really writing something uh, for publication or something like that, you know, you're going to rewrite that several times. So it's like that with learning a language. Um, you're going to have to, you're going to have to forget and relearn over and over and over. So that's why on the vocabulary, that's just going to be a process of review because you will learn the vocabulary and you will come into class uh, for the first vocabulary quiz that we have and you will know all of those vocabulary words. And you will come and you will get 100% on the vocabulary quiz. And you will be very happy. And you will go uh, home sharing that with your significant other. And you will celebrate and rejoice. And by the time the next week comes, if you haven't looked at it, you'll forget some of those words. See? So that's a process of review. Same thing with the endings. right? 
uh, it wouldn't be a bad thing uh, to get, and I think there are blank cards probably that come in the uh, in the set of vocabulary cards. But you can you can make cards out of three by five cards, or just use three by five cards, or whatever. It's not a bad thing to make your own cards uh, with the uh, endings and stuff on them that we're going to learn, uh, so that you can review those things. Right. So so don't think you're going to go through uh, the book, look at it. Okay, I have it memorized, and that's the end of the story. You know, that's just the very beginning. You haven't forgotten it enough at that point to really know it, right? But I want you to get to the point where you know it well enough so that if I call you up at two in the morning and say, give me the cow perfect endings, will you do that? And then you just, you won't even have to wake up all the way. You know, you just rattle them off and I'll say, great, see you in class. You won't even remember I called. Did you ever remember me calling you? No. See, you won't even remember I called, uh, but you'll just be able to, to whip the endings uh, off with no problem. You'll, you'll, you'll have forgotten them so much that you'll never lose them at that point. Uh, you understand the point I'm making, though? It's all about review. And uh, I had one professor that used the illustration of balloons. You blow up these balloons, and lo and behold, you find they leak air. And you have to keep blowing them up, you know. And uh, that's, that's what you have to do. All right, the next page has the schedule, fairly simple schedule. Uh, first tonight, week one, we go over the syllabus and then we do the first couple of chapters of uh, the text. Um, this is going to be really weird to you for a couple of weeks. You know, the Hebrew thing, um, going backwards, uh, chicken scratch for letters, you know, that sort of a thing. Um, that's completely normal for you to feel, you know, completely lost. Uh, with all of that. Um, but there'll come a point probably when just something, you know, will switch and you will be utterly surprised that all of a sudden it's going to be second nature to you. In a, in a week or two, uh, after studying this, all of a sudden, bam. You know, you'll just look at a Hebrew text and be able to see what it is. You, know, you go from right to left just automatically, be able to, to read it. And uh, your, your brain will just kick in and it will be okay. So it's going to seem really weird for a little while. Uh, but after a while, it just really will become second nature. And uh, you will be able to uh, look at uh, pictures of Greek manuscripts and books and see when they put them upside down because they tend to do that. And uh, you'll be able to recognize that. So you'll see the chapters that we're going to cover in the uh, text. And so what I want you to do uh, obviously, you can't do that for tonight, but I would like you to read um, the chapters that we're going to cover before you come to class. Uh, read them through so you know what's happening when we get to class. And uh, then after class, then you'll know exactly what to study, what you have to memorize, and all those sorts of things. Um, and then after class, you'll do the chapters in the workbook corresponding to those chapters. So read the chapter in the text uh, before class and then after class go back and study those chapters and uh, do the workbook after class. And then when you come back the next week you'll be ready for the quizzes on those things. So this week it's kind of tough and we'll, we'll try to to, to flex with you on that but as soon as you can get the textbook and the, the workbook um, you know read through the first and second chapter and catch up on that and then um, read three and four if possible before Monday if you can't you don't, if we don't get the books in time you can't you can't that's understandable but uh, we'll try to work in that way Okay, so that's the syllabus. Any questions on the syllabus? Yes, okay. Carl, do you have any idea what the books are doing? Carl's thinking this week, right? Okay. Uh, ho- hopefully soon. Should we just call him? Yeah. All right. Any other questions? That's a good question. Yes, sir. What are we going to do with our old books? Oh, 
was just going to say, <coughs> the books that you got, the, the white books, mm-hmm. I believe you can turn those back into Carl. As long as you haven't written all At least those weren't expensive. Were they? No, we're, we're definitely upgrading. <laughs> <coughs> All right, any other questions? All right, take your copy of the uh, alphabet. Isn't it great? It's, it's, it's kind of an awesome thought to think that... Uh, we're going to be struggling tonight with what kindergartners in Israel can just do. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> now, by the way, uh, we're going to use the uh, modern Hebrew uh, pronunciations um, because, well, for two reasons. Uh, probably the most important, uh, that's what I learned. And you get to learn what I learned. Uh, but also, if you should happen to uh, go ahead and take some modern Hebrew, which wouldn't be much of a stretch, really, um, then you'll already, you know, be that much further along the, the road. Uh, you know, who cares? How, you know, don't get me wrong, right? But who cares uh, how Moses pronounced Hebrew on one level? Right? I mean, I know there's some exegetical places where it might matter, but you know, who cares what his? I mean, we're not going to pronounce it with the right accent anyway, right? Really, what we're doing is seminary Hebrew, right? Um, so, uh, if you go to Israel, you know, and you learn a little Hebrew, or you're reading the signs, or whatever, you know, uh, better that you be able to pronounce it. I think in uh, the way they pronounce it today, and you know, modern Hebrew is a lot like biblical Hebrew. In fact, it's based on biblical Hebrew um, anyway, so there's not that, I mean, the vocabulary is not different because you don't find you know, airplane and typewriter in the Old Testament, but um, you know, there's a remarkable similarity. So we're going to use the modern Hebrew uh, way of pronouncing and doing the alphabet. So the first letter is Aleph. Uh, so I'll say Aleph and you say it after me. Olive. Olive. Good. And that's what it looks like. I'm sure you had to write it in a little bit. Uh, the next letter is bait. Alright. Then gimel. Dalit. Hey. Vav. Now that's modern Hebrew. He's telling you it's pronounced like a W. That would be the ancient Hebrew way. But we're going to pronounce it the modern Hebrew way. Vav. And anyway, didn't it sound weird to say wow? <laughs> I mean, you know. This is crazy enough as it is. All right. Zion. 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 Chet. Chet. Yeah, there you go. So you got to get that. You know, it's like the German. Right? Uh, so, Chet. Tate. Tate. Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mame, Noon, Samek, Ayan, Pei, Sade, Kof, Reish, Sheen, I'm not going to say Sheen. I'm going to take there being 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. All right. um, sheen. Sheen. Tav. Tav. All right, good. Um, now, you can see the difference between Sheen and Sheen there uh, is simply the placement of the dot. You see that? Uh, so you're, you can remember it in this way, that if the dot is on the right... What's right cannot be sin. You see, my Hebrew professor said that uh, you know, uh, if you're on the right politically, then that isn't sin. But I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> uh, so if the uh, if the dot is on the left, that's sin. 
the daughter's on the right. That's Shin. All right, so let's uh, you say them uh, right along with me, with me, um, and you can go ahead and, and uh, look as you did at the uh, English version of the name this time, and uh, we'll go through it again. So say them along with me, ready? Olive, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, Hay, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tate, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Main. Nu, Samek, Ayan, Pei, Sade, Kof, Resh, Shin, Tav. All right, now, try to cover up the English part of it. Because what you really want to do is be able to know the name of the letter as you see it in Hebrew, right? Now, you might want to follow along with your finger or whatever, whatever you need to do. Um, all right, and same along with me. Olive, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, He, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tate, Yod, Ka, Lamed, Main, Nun, Samet, Ayan, Pe. Sare, Kof, Reish, Shin, Tav. Wow, that was very good. All right, now, you should be able to sing an alphabet. Shouldn't you? All right. So, let me sing the alphabet for you once, and then you can uh, join me in singing the alphabet. All right? It's to the tune of bringing in the sheep. You know, whenever they're in, in church in a western or you know, a little house on the prairie or something, it seems like they always sing "Bringing in the Sheaves," right? Well, anyway, it goes like this: Olive bay gim old dalit hay bav zayin chete yod kaf la mid maim noon samek ayin peit zade kof reishing tov. There you go. All right, ready to go with me now? <laughs> this is taped, isn't it? All right. Should have thought about that. Anyway, here we go. Olive bay gimo dalit hay bav zayin kate yod kaflamet main noon samek ayin peit zade Wow, you guys are fast learners. That's pretty awesome. All right, I'm going to start you off, and, and I'm going to hear you do it without me this time. You, you feel like you're getting this? Yeah? Yes. Oh, no, that's okay. No, that's, yeah, that's all right. We've got lots of time and lots of work to do here. Uh, all right, let's sing it again. Ready? All of the that that was pretty heavenly till right at the end there. That's pretty good. <laughs> All right, now, are you doing this just looking at the Hebrew letters, or you're looking at anything? That's okay. That's, that's perfectly fine. Um, but try to focus more, you know, cover up, cover up those English letters, right? Cover up those English letters, and just look at, just look at recognizing the uh, Hebrew letters. Now, like I said, pretty soon, you know, this is going to be, um, you know, a... Uh, a thought process that you're not even aware of happening. You look at those, you're just, and it's going to happen sooner than you think. All right? So try to cover up the English, and let's sing it again. And just, you know, try to let the names of these letters uh, sink in. Um, the great thing about um, Hebrew, as with Greek, that the name of letter gives you a really good clue as to the sound of the letter. All right? So. Now, Aleph is basically silent, but Beit is going to sound like a B, and 
Gimel is going to sound like a G, right? Gimel, Dalit, Hey, like an H, Vav, like a V, Zion, a Z, Chet, sounds like right? Uh, T, Tate, sounds like a T, and Yod sounds like a Y, Kaf, sounds like a K, Lamed, sounds like an L, Main, sounds like an M, Noon, sounds like an N, Samet, sounds like an S, Ayin is basically silent for us. It's just too hard for us to do that Ayin, you know, Hebrew thing. Um, pay sounds like a P. Sade sounds like a T-S. Um, that's a little bit like Zeta, isn't it? But it's Sade. Um, Kof sounds like K again. Uh, Resh sounds like R. Um, Sin, uh, with the dot on the left, sounds like an S. Sheen. Uh, with the dot on the right, sounds like an S H, and uh, top sounds <coughs> like a T. So the name of a letter gives you the clues to how the thing is pronounced. All right. Uh, so just look at that uh, Hebrew letter, and uh, we'll sing it again and try to get used to to associating the name of the letter with the letter. Uh, now by next week, uh, you'll be able to write out the alphabet on a piece of paper. Just, you know, from memory. Right? Um, but, you know, there's a little work between now and then. Right? All right, so try to concentrate on the uh, Hebrew letters and we'll sing it again. Aleph, Bein, Gimel, Dalet, Hei, Vav, Zayin, Chei, Tei, Yod, Kav, Lamed, Mein, Nun, Samek, I in Pesade, Kofreshinta. Very good. Now, it might seem silly to sing it, but that will help you remember it. So use that song this week to remember the alphabet. Um, when you're learning a language, and, and this applies particularly to Hebrew as it does in Greek, you want to try to use as many um, gates into your brain as you possibly can. You know, if you could taste it, we'd try that, right? Um, so you want to use your eye gate, and so you're looking at it. You, you know, you can speak. Uh, so when you're studying by yourself, you know, learning vocabulary, don't just look at it on the page, but say the word. You know, um, say it to yourself and hear it, and that will help you with it. Um, so singing uh, will help because that's, that's a, using music is another way of causing something to stick uh, in your brain alright let's try this one more time cover up that English and let's see if you can just look at the Hebrew letters and uh, get it down all of Now take out a piece of paper. Um, All right, so obviously you're not going to be able to uh, write in this fancy script like you see uh, on the page here, uh, unless you have like a paintbrush or something, you know, or a stylus or something like that. Um, so how are you going to actually write these things? All right, so we're going to start over at the right-hand side of the paper, and we're going to make an olive, olive, like that. Or thereabouts. See how we did that? Just make a line sliding down from left to right and then kind of make a backwards S sort of thing. So write a few of those on the first line of your paper. And 
and show them to your neighbor. Uh, look, look at your neighbors. You know, make sure you're doing them okay, right? Get some coaching. Uh, if you're not if you're not doing them okay, then uh, if you're not doing them all right, then let's get you some help, right? Okay, so there's some olives. Bake. Okay, here you go. Ready? Nothing up my sleeve. So you start at the top, come down, make a line that goes just past the bottom, just past that uh, vertical line. So it's almost like a hangman's noose thing. But now, this bottom line going past the vertical line just a bit is very important because that distinguishes it from other letters. So make a few bases. Look over the shoulder of your neighbor and make sure they're doing it correctly. Come on. <laughs> All right, Gimel, ready? Gimel, start the top, little curl. This is more like a lambda, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, Dalit. Uh, line across the top and then a line down. Now, when you make a Dalit, make sure you leave this little part sticking past the vertical part. And make sure that the dalit um, covers the space of a line, but no higher or lower. You'll know why later. See that again? So on your line, the dalit covers just, just the space of the line, not going above the line or below the line. And make sure that on your dalit, you have this part that sticks out to the right a little bit past the vertical line. All of the demo, all of the pay. Okay, you start over here and just come down. No part sticking out to the right. Okay. And then another vertical line here that does not connect with the line that's horizontal on the top. Again, uh, straight down, all of this just covering the space of the line. All right, evolve, same thing, start at the top of the line, make a little crook, and down to the bottom of the line. Yeah. Zion. Just make a line like this, and then a line down to the bottom of the line. All right. Now, K is like a hay, but it closes that gap. So. Feet just like that. Straight line down. We're leaving our little tittle. Right? We'll read in the book about that later on. Remember when Jesus said not a jot or a tittle would pass away from the law? Those, are, those little things are tittle. Yes, you have a question? No, so this is the only difference between that and that is this is no gap and no has a gap. So exactly. So there's a little gap here, and that's the only difference between a hay and a feet. You talked about the line, and we assuming that all these letters touch the line on both sides, and as you tell us that line. Exactly. <coughs> Good point. All right. Kate. Kate. Kind of like this. <coughs> there are various ways to do that, but that's the way I like to do it. Is there? Can you do that again? Oh, I don't know. It's 
looked away from the room. But you see, distract you with this hand. Right. It's kind of a lazy G, isn't it? All right, Yod is just a small letter. So this is the jot, the jot and the tittle. You've seen the tittles. Here's the jot, the Yod. Uh, the Yod starts at the top and just comes a little ways down like that. So that's not going to fill up the whole line. All right, now the cough works like this. It's kind of rounded, but this fiddle on the bait is important because it distinguishes it clearly from a cop. Cop. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, the llama is the one that is fun to write. It's kind of better if you're standing up because it helps if you have a little hit. When you write a llama, a llama, or when you write a llama, either way. <laughs> All right. Start just above the line and come down, and then follow the line to the right, and then down something like that. Or so, start above the line. Yep. That part starts above the line. Whoa. And it comes down like that. You say above the line, you mean line of the paper? Yeah. Yeah. See if I'm if I'm writing if I'm writing the law that would look like that. trying to, to do the, the book script thing here because that would be pretty hard to, to copy. But those are, so what I'm doing is handwriting script. Now, this is like handwriting printing. There's also uh, like a more handwriting cursive sort of a way. That, those look pretty weird. It's kind of hard to do. So, I mean, it's kind of like in a, in a book, you know, you might see an A that looks like that. And some people write their A's like that, but most people don't. So when we're right handwriting, you know, we write an A like that. But, you know, cursive might be, I don't know. Cursive, cursive A's like a printed A. Maybe a printed A is more like that in kindergarten. I don't know. But the point being is there are various styles of, you know, books print and how you write handwriting and cursive. All right, main, <coughs> noon, noon, all of these after the long bit, the main, the noon, uh, fill up the line. So the noon looks like a, like a right hand bracket, really. Um, you know, it doesn't hurt if you make the bottom line a little longer than the top line. You'll probably be really good if, uh, at writing the Hebrew alphabet if you're like a graphic artist or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it really helps out. Really <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, between the cough uh, and the nude, and just the cough is really rounded? Yeah, the cough is rounded, and the cough has probably longer, I probably made these too long on my noon here, has really longer, uh, you know, parts here. From the new. Summit is kind of like a backwards 
sigma. I mean, you can do it like that, or you can do it like that, and you can make a circle and put a line on it, however you want to do it. But that covers the whole line as well. No touches? Top touches top and bottom. Yeah. So basically, this line here would be on the top, should make them all the same side. That line is on the top, as the line. Okay, ion goes like this, and that basically covers the whole line as well. You know, you just tell they missed the basket. Yeah. You can tell they missed the whole backboard. You know, they play soccer too. <laughs> okay, ion, how are we doing? So it's kind of like a Y. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. But you know, you're paying a lot of money for this class, so don't just make a walk. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. Um. All right. Pay is uh, kind of one of those corn mazes. Start kind of in the middle of the line and go this way, and this way, this way, this way, this way. Now, Sade is a little bit almost like kind of but not really a backwards iron. All right, so for the Sade, you're going to come down like this and over and add that mark there. Now for the cove. Again, you're paying a lot of money for the class, so don't just make a fee. Um, start about maybe a little lower or about where the top of the line is and go down a little bit below, below the line with the vertical, right? And then start up here, and then this basically takes up all or most of the line, this part right here. But, you know, make it a little bit artistic, right, taking it right there, so you're not just making a fee. Give it a little flair. Just a little more. Yeah, that's right. Just a little more. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right. Hey, anybody watch the race this weekend? <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> All right. I hate all the jokes. <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> you know, it's all. I've never, I've never seen this happen before. <laughs> yeah. Or should we get all that on video? Got to keep reminding us we're on the video. Though. It's a good thing to be reminded of that. All right, cope, race. Um, start at the top of the line. This is going to cover the whole line. Oops, it's got to be a bit rounded. Something like that. My second one's better. You said that's line to line, but that's below. The no, it's all just on the line. It, it, I mean, it's within the line. It's perfectly within the line. And notice, there's no, uh, you know tittle here, as there is with the Dalek, so that's going to distinguish that from the Dalek. Okay, now, uh, Sheen, how's it just that at the bottom? Uh, short, uh, longer on the top. Okay. That's virtually the only difference when you write it. Um, Sheen and Seen, just make a like that, and then over on that side, you put that, 
and for uh, seen, we put the dot there. For sheen, we put the dot there. How can we do the alphabet? We don't do the seen. Um, Mostly because that's the way I learned it. <laughs> it's probably more like the modern Hebrew way of doing it. Uh, and well, when you see the uh, acrostics in the Bible, the Psalms that are acrostics, um, the they will use 22 letters. They will not use a sheen and a sheen. They will just use one of those. So there's a good biblical exegetical reason for I'm using 22 <laughs> <laughs> you have both of those there. Yeah, one of the one of the land. Yeah, this is a C. That's a C. Just where you put the dot. And then the top. Uh, I'd like the H hey or the K. Hey, um, starts the same. Okay, when you come down here, that connects. So now it's just like a K. So I get to the bottom and I put a little tail on it like that, a little hook on it. So I do it just like a K. Until I get to the very last step and I put that little hook on it, make it a top. <coughs> Anybody have any trouble with these letters? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Alright, let's sing it again. Ready? All the Not as hard as you thought. Um, just like we said in Greek class, if it were easy, everybody would want to be a pastor, and we can't have that. Right? There's got to be something difficult about it. All right. Um, you can see that some of these letters might be easily confused. Yes, all right. Uh, if you were really in Israel, you'd have a pronunciation for the uh, ayin. But we won't do it because it's too hard on us. We don't want to make it too hard because then nobody wants to be a pastor. Um, we already know that Hebrew is written from right to left. Some of these letters have final forms. Um, the kaf. Kaf has a final form, which looks like this. Okay, just like a dollet, except it comes down below the line significantly. Okay. What does that mean? Thank you. Like a final signal. Okay, if it comes at the end of a word, then you use the final form. Okay. Um, so anytime you have a cough, at the very end of the word, it's going to look like this, and not like that. Okay. Um, Mame. 
that we wrote like this for the normal form is going to look like this in the final form. Alright, I might want to watch how we write that. Yo. Kind of a box with that last little trap door thing. So if the name comes at the end of a word, it's going to be like this, and not like that. Uh, noon. For its final form, simply goes like that, and then down below the line. Instead of swinging back over at the bottom of the line, it just extends down below the line. Hey, instead of being like this, it is like this. Again, it just extends down below the line. Now I'm, I'm writing this from over here so I can see I'm slanting. I mean to be going straight up and down here, you understand. Right? And then finally, Sade, which we like this uh, in its final form just extends down the the line. So ka, main, noon, pe, sale. The final forms. It's just like in Greek the sigma at the end of a word, just like that. Right. What was this? Uh, okay. Uh, now we need to know about the the God plot letters. Right. So. Let's do this. Let's use that sheet you have. Let's mark. Let's mark the letters with a final form. So, cough. And I'm going to write a little. I'm going to write a little cough to the right of that cough that's written to show the final form of cough. Oh, do we have that page? Yeah. No way. Yeah. Oh, you are so cool. Oh, there it is on the bottom of page two. Thanks, Cyrus. Couldn't get along without you. See them right there? Cough, main, noon, page, thought eight. They're the final form. Good, I'm glad we have, you know, it's a good thing I had you copy that. That made sense. Um, okay, any questions on that? And then page three, there are the Begod, Begod Kafat letters. Okay, uh, do you see about four lines down to the right? We see them in parentheses right there. Um, Bait, Gimo, Dalit, Kaf, Pe, and Tav are the Begad Kafat letters. Now, what is Begad Kafat? Just put an E, A, E, A between those consonants and you get Begad Kafat. Right? Um, <coughs> six of the Hebrew consonants have two possible but close related pronunciations. Collectively, these are known as the Begad Kafat consonants. Uh, this term is simply a mnemonic device allowing for the easy memorization of the six letters. To distinguish between the two pronunciations, a dot called a dogish lene. Now, the dogish is a dot. Lene means weak. So this is going to be the weak dogish. We're going to get a dogish forte later, which is a strong dogish. Okay. So here is a dogish lene was inserted into the consonantal character. See how there are dots right in the middle of those? Bait, gimel, dalit, kaf, pe, tav. See how it has a dot in it? It's a dogish lene in the begad kafat letters. Now, the presence of the dogish lene indicates a hard pronunciation, and its absence denotes a soft pronunciation. The dogish lene will only appear in the Begad Kafat letters. The student should learn the different pronunciations indicated below. You'll also notice that each letter without the dogish lene is transliterated with a small horizontal line, either below or above the English character. Memorize both the pronunciation and the transliteration. So I'm not going to be 
you know, real tied up in the whole transliteration thing. Notice it, you know. Um, the chances of you seeing it on a quiz are extremely small, right? Um, notice it, be aware of it, but I'm not going to get too tied up in making sure you know how to transliterate stuff. Um, he talks about that and why it's important because tra uh, commentaries use it and stuff like that, but you know, you'll be able to deal with it. All right, so uh, he gives you all of these alternate translations for these. Um, Mark, put an X out to the left of the bait and put an X out to the left of the pay. In our modern Hebrew translation, those are the only two we're going to actually change the pronunciation of. Okay? So if the bait has a doggish in it, it will have a B sound. If the bait does not have the doggish in it, it will have a V sound. Now you know that um, linguistically, B and B are very close sounds. The difference only being two lips together, B, and teeth and lips together, B, B, B. And so in languages, you actually see, um, you know, switching. Like if you, you know, if you're going between various languages, you see uh, Bs and Vs substituted for one another. So that, that's a very close sound linguistically. We will pronounce those differently. Um, you know, as to doing, you know, the difference between a hard G is in God and a, and a GH is in a gas, well, that's a pretty slight difference, and most of us wouldn't even pronounce that difference, would we? All right? I'm not going to worry about that. Day is in day, and DH is in the. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, same thing with the K and the CH is in Bach. I'm not going to do that. But P and F, we will. Doggish in the in the pay, um, then we're going to pronounce it as a P. No doggish in the pay, we're going to pronounce it as a PH or an F. And we're not going to do the TH thing with the tongue of either. Right. So these are changes that happened in ancient Hebrew, and we're only doing the two in modern. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, um, when a Bagad Kafat letter begins a word it will always have at least a doggish lane right so you'll never have a bait at the beginning of the word with a V sound and all down through whenever you see one of these the God to fought letters beginning a word it always has a doggish lane alright and then the gutter rules um Ayan, or sorry, Aleph, Ayan, He, He, and sometimes Reish uh, are gutturals. What do we mean by gutturals? Well, exactly. You say the, the letter from the back of your throat. Ayan, Aleph, He, He, sometimes Reish. <laughs> right. um, and We'll be learning some things about the guttural letter later on. Like you cannot put any kind of a doggish in a guttural letter or raish. You never put a doggish in. There'll be doggish fortes coming along, right? But you never have a doggish forte. You only ever have a doggish lane in a begot kafat letter, but you never have a doggish forte in a guttural. So just to remember that. Okay. So. The God to plot letters, final forms, gutturals, that's good. Um, letters that look alike. Um, what's the difference between a bait and a cough? All right, yeah. Okay, the bait is more square, but it also has the, the line at the bottom with the tail, with the tittle to the right. See, that, that's very important. That's going to distinguish the bait from the cough. What's the difference between a gimel and a noon? And the bottom leg of the gimel, uh, instead of just being horizontal on the bottom line, it's, it's at an angle up like that, right? But those look kind of similar. The uh, difference between a hay and a hate. Well, the hate closes up the gap right there, right? 
difference between a hay and a hay and a tate. The tate closes up the gap. Sorry, not the tate, the tav. The tav closes up the gap, but also has that little hook on the bottom. Okay, so those are three letters that look an awful lot alike, uh, but are different in just a slight way. All right. This one does the gimel look like? Uh, a little bit like the noon. Um, obviously, the <coughs> sheen and the scene. The only difference is the dot, but you'll get used to that. Uh, the final maim and the samek look a little bit alike. In if you look in your alphabet, <coughs> in book print, in book print, the final maim and the samek look a little bit alike. Masamic is more rounded, though, isn't it? Um, the Dalit and the Raish look alike, but the Raish is more rounded and doesn't have the, the little tittle on it that the Dalit has, right? So remember when you're writing a Dalit to put that little part up going a little bit further to the right. Okay. The Tsade and the Ayan uh, are kind of confusing. They, they look a little bit alike, although they're a bit backwards, aren't they? Uh, the Vav and the Zion can look alike. See them right next to each other, right there. But the Zion has that slanted part at the top. Uh, try to try to minimize the uh, top of the valve as much as you can. So it's like you put that even more here, uh, and then you won't be so confused with other letters, right? Um, the valve and the final noon look an awful lot alike. The only difference is the length of the vertical uh, line there, right? The valve's going to stop at the bottom of the line. And the final noon is going to go down below the bottom of the line. Right. So that'd be easy to confuse. And a final cough and a final noon can look alike. What's the difference between a final cough and a final noon? Tittle on the cough. Mm-hmm. Plus the, the horizontal uh, thing at the top of the cough is going to be a lot longer than the noon is going to be. All right, so keep those things in mind. Um, that's about it for the alphabet part. Any questions on the alphabet so far? All right, let me hear you sing it one more time. Alep Beit Awesome. See, that's a lot better. Like, you feel like you're starting to get it a little bit? See? You'll get it. All right. Now, those are all the consonants. You notice those are all consonants? All right? Where do we get the vowels? Well, uh, Hebrew is uh, usually written without vowels, just with consonants. So if you go to Israel <coughs> and you get a newspaper... No vowel. <laughs> Just consonant. Now, if you get, like, you know, a kid's book, you know, some of those will have the vowels in them. Right? Uh, fortunately, our Bibles have vowels in them to help us. And, uh, I don't know, somewhere before 1000 AD, the Masoretes, <coughs> the text we use is a Masoretic text. The, the Masoretic scholars, Hebrew scholars, back before 1000 AD, decided they better figure out a way of uh, writing the vowel sounds so they wouldn't be lost or changed. So they devised uh, a method of adding the vowel sounds in a written form to the text. But they didn't want to change uh, the consonant text at all in the process. Uh, because they had a very high view of the inspiration of Scripture, and you know that is the text that's inspired. So, without changing that, they devised a system of lines and marks and dots and kind of chicken scratch stuff to us, really, you know, to indicate the vowels uh, around those uh, consonants. So it's kind of cool because they didn't have to change the text to add the vowels to the text. 
In fact, if you take your Bible, you will see we should get ourselves used to finding Genesis <coughs> Genesis 1, 1. There's a whole lot of stuff. At some point, it would be kind of nifty for you to uh, sit down and read the preface to your Hebrew Bible. And you can pick what language you want to read it in. Uh, you know, you can um, you can learn it in Deutsch. You can uh, you can read it in Deutsch if you want to. Uh, what other languages do we have here? There's English. That's a good thing. Anyway, French, probably a source of languages here. Anyway, if you get past all of that, you can see, well, you can see the sigla. What are the sigla, the signs, the uh, abbreviations, and the apparatus? You can see all that kind of stuff that's there. You see that? You can keep going past that. You come to the table of contents. Uh, Sometimes look at the table of contents. Huh? Starts off pretty normal. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Regis, Kings. So look at that little bit, little bit different order there. But understand, uh, same exact books that we have in our English Old Testament. Uh, different grouping. We don't have a first and second Samuel or first and second Kings here. A uh, little bit different grouping and different order. You can figure them out. Uh, uh, Threni, um, three fourths of the way down the uh, second column is Lamentations. Beyond that, Genesis. All right. Now, the notice when you look in your Bible, what do you see? Well, you see consonants, don't you? All right. Uh, somebody tell me. Now, you'll know that the first word is there on the right, isn't it? See, you didn't look on the left there, did you? All right. You want to look at the right. See where the number one is right there? On the right. All right. So, uh, what's the first letter of the first word? Bay. What can you tell me about that letter? Why does it sound like a B? Well, it's got a doggish lane. Why does it have a doggish lane? It's a begod kafat letter. Right? And because it's a begod kafat letter and it's at the beginning of the word, it's got to have a doggish lane. So it's not going to be pronounced like a B, it's going to be pronounced like a B. Right? Okay, what's the second letter? Raish. Alright. Third letter? Aleph. Next letter? Sheen. Next letter? Yod. And? Kav. Okay, awesome. Now, see all those other little marks around the consonants? Some of those are vowels. Uh, some of those are accents. And some of those are other marks. Alright. Um... In your Bible, did you get... What's up with that? I guess I don't have mine in this Bible. In your Bible, did you get a little uh, accent marker thing you move on? Yeah, cool. All right, those are good. Um, we're not going to deal with that a whole lot probably in the beginning class. This little job right here, right, uh, gives you a list of the accent markers. Okay. Um... One side, one side gives you the uh, accent markers for um, Psalms, Job, and Proverbs, which are different. <coughs> and the other side gives you the, for the rest of the Bible. Um, they're kind of tiny, huh? Uh, there are there are disjunctive and conjunctive accents and the first list are the um, disjunctive accents 
like a period would be disjunctive because it separates, right? And so the very first accent you see there really functions like a period. The saluk so pasuk functions like a period right there. And um, so that's a disjunctive accent. There are other accents that that uh, hold together. So once you start doing exegesis and you wonder where the sentence or the clause breaks, right? You wonder where the comma should go, which matters in our interpretation sometimes. You can look at the accent and determine now is that a disjunctive or a conjunctive because the accent is going to tell you these, these two letters go together not apart or these two letters should be separated not taken together and so sometimes that can help you well that's down the road right um, what I've done in some of my Bibles that is very nifty because it obviously be easy to lose this and you don't want to lose this I mean where do you go to get another one of these right um, so what I've done is if you if you take them in this in this uh, the first pages by the cover is probably pretty pretty stiff, right? In your Bible? Am I right about that in that Bible? You don't want to do this on the map page. Take this, take this right here, put it in here, right? Um, take a sharp knife, mark it with a pencil first, so that you take a sharp knife and cut slits where the corners of this would be, so that you can slip this in those slits, and it'll hold it right there, right? And then put a little scotch tape on the end of where you slice so it doesn't keep tearing. Right? So you've made your, you know, like, the, remember the old picture albums we used to have where you had those little things that held the corners in? Well, you've kind of made something like that. Yeah, I know all you young ones, you know. But there are pictures of me in albums like that, so watch it. Um, <laughs> old black and whites, you know? <laughs> um, you understand what I'm saying? And that way it will hold it in there. So if you could figure out another way to make some sort of pocket to put in there, that's fine. Yes? Could you just roll it up on a copy machine and each side and separate it out and space them up? Yes, you could do that. But I did this before there were copy machines, so now I'm teasing. But that's that's a good idea. Making a copy of it and blowing it up is a really good idea. And you know, I find it very a lot more difficult than I used to to read my Hebrew Bible, uh, even though I have progressive lenses. Um, and some of these dots are hard to see. Uh, there is another. I, th- I hope they still. I hope it's still in print. The original version of this was about twice the size, and the print was about twice the size. <laughs> now it was kind of cool when they came up with a little version so you could carry it, but now it's not so cool. So I don't know. I want one of those big ones. So if I ever find one of those big ones, um, I know you young guys, you're getting there. You're headed there. Um, you know. My problem so far with the paper is seeing. It. We'll see. There you go. Then. No, it's really good. <laughs> uh, but actually a photocopy of this page blown up would help so that, but yeah that's a good idea making a photocopy that's a pretty good idea but try to figure out a way not to lose that and then the, the blue sheet you got on there is probably the um, Sigler again isn't it for the apparatus Sigler what does it, what does it say on there <laughs> That's for the New Testament. Yeah, that's that's probably um, that's probably the symbols, the text and stuff used in the apparatus of the New Testament. I do the same thing with this. Try to try to tuck it in there. In Latin, this is Buy those in, did you buy those Bibles in dollars or what? <laughs> Marks, I think. Marks. 
Uh, all right, so we're looking at we're looking at Genesis one one, and we see um, some vowels. Uh, we saw the dagesh lene in the bait. See those two uh, dots on top of one another under the bait. That's a shiva. See the 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 dots under the resh. That is a sere. I was tells you that the uh, olive there is functioning as a vowel. We'll talk about that. Uh, under the uh, under the sheen is a comet, and after the sheen is a yod. So we have a comet yod, and then the top is just the last letter. Okay. All right, and that circle, see that circle thing up there? Mm-hmm. That little tiny circle thing between the olive and the sheen above them, that's an accent mark. It looks to me like. All right, so that's how, and so you can see, well, you can take a look at the, um, the name of Genesis in Hebrew, no vowels, right? So you can see what that would look like. Um, and then you can see the same word with all the vowels. You can, of course, you can see the other words with all of the vowel points. So that's what the vowel points are going to look like. Okay. So hold that spot in your Bible. What time is it anyway? It's almost eight o'clock. Um, let's take a break now, and we'll get into the vowels when we get back. How long of a break do you want to take? Uh, it's up to you. If you want to take a short break, we'll get out early. Or if you want to take a long break, we won't get out so early. Short. So it is uh, about quarter to eight. If we could try to start again somewhere in the neighborhood of eight, that would be great. And then uh, 